Okay, okay, okay. So um, today, this afternoon, we have a uh, Jean Bresson, and um, he's going to. He has already present his topics, uh, but um, what can I say? Uh, as I know Jean uh, from last year, I think he's he the guy that works with open music and do all the the difficult things with the software engine. But also is a nice person to talk. We have been discussed many things. And today he is going, I guess, as I understand, he's going to persuade you about how it's important for a composer to know how to program or to know a little about programming. I don't know if it's that your talk. I'm sorry if I'm uh -huh. trying to anticipate. But at least from his experience I think he, he tries to make a very good connection between program language and musical thing. And also I would like to thank people from USP that are here, Fernando, Adriani, and, and the students. It's uh, great to have you here. You didn't, let's say, it was not enough the virtual experience, in the real experience sometimes. Also uh, I'd like to, for people there, we have already the poster of the concert on 28th of August here at Almanac Café in Balão Geraldo. This is the concert that's going to end uh, our, let's say, our meeting. We're going to try to end with music. And that's, that's I think it's a good idea to have this whole theoretical framework and converge to produce music. So, uh, I think if, if everything is said, Thank you, Jean, for your talk. Jean Bresson. Okay. Thank you. Oops. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, Jonatas, again for all this organization. Um, so this uh, this presentation today will be not very much related to compositional applications because yesterday uh, I tried to focus on how the different tools and the research uh, carried out in open music could be applied with some uh, uh, real example of a, of a piece. Uh, in this presentation, I try to uh, focus on the tools that can be used, generally speaking, for modeling or analysis or uh, interacting with the uh, environment, but uh, not really focusing on the concrete application. So you can imagine what would be the application, but uh, I, will, I will try to uh, show you some different kinds of interface that go beyond the simple, way, the simple fact of doing programs and visual programs uh, in open music. So I tried to gather several projects because we have quite a lot of time, it's more than two hours, uh, and I will show different of these projects. Uh, depending on the time we have, uh, and uh, hopefully make a, a good uh, set of all these tools uh, in this perspective of uh, programming, modeling, and interacting uh, in open music. So the first two projects I will present you are concern uh, are, are not all projects, but they are uh, they are a few years old. The first one uh, is, uh, sorry, is the OM sheet interface. It's this uh, editor here, and the second one is a framework for uh, uh, segmentation and analysis that we developed recently in the Open Music Score editors. Okay, so the composers have uh, numerous. They are surrounded by numerous interfaces and supports for their creation. So as I said before, uh, the, the visual program or the program, if it's not about visual programming, is, is just the, the place where uh, all the, the ideas and process of the composer are uh, grouped together. But uh, we also think it's important to take into account all the other supports uh, of uh, musical creation and particularly the scores. Um, so uh, the different uh, uh, projects I will show here are aimed at going, as I said, uh, a little bit further than just making a, a program and running a program, but uh, try to focus on the different interfaces that allow the composer to be 
the real experimentator of his own musical uh, mind and uh, making this kind of modeling process uh, with formalization, implementation of concept, experimentation, etc. So, um, my presentation will be mostly uh, uh, interactive. I will switch from my slides to the open music environment, but I have a, f a few uh, screenshots here that show a little bit the, the, the main ideas of uh, this uh, editor. So, OM Sheet is uh, um, a special kind of score editor that was uh, developed by uh, Carlos Sagon and myself. Uh, it's presented in this paper from a computer music journal, 2008. And the idea was to ex extend the, uh, the concept of a maquette that uh, Gérard showed uh, on Monday. It was an interface where you, get, you can consider at the same time as a sequencer of musical da data and as a program where musical data is related together. So we wanted to keep this idea, but focusing on the uh, notion of musical notation in order to have something that really or uh, tries to look uh, as a score as much as possible. So this is a sheet editor, and this is a box in Open Music. I will show a real one right after. You see here that you can put together different kind of musical notation, sounds. Uh, you can even put maquettes, as, the, as uh, we've seen before, inside the sheet and, and, and uh, in a different voice as a score. Uh, and there is a special uh, algorithm inside that uh, tries to align everything so that the different objects you put together are always uh, correctly placed uh, on the space of your score corresponding to their uh, time of occurrence. So for instance, here in this, in this example, you have, you have four notes, four quarter notes, and uh, at this place I insert this kind of uh, little melody here. So you see that the two notes are automatically uh, spaced in order to leave the space for this one. So that makes some uh, sometimes some strange behaviors, but uh, we we focused on having all this uh, this this time uh, synchronization consistent all the time. For instance, you see if you put two voices together, you have some things like the bars here that take some space. So that makes uh, a, a space being added here. So the the different voices are considered together in order to compute the uh, optimal spacing for the whole score. And this is a sound aligned with a, a voice also. You see here, if you look just as the score, it's regularly uh, segmented. And here, some segments are um, <coughs> uh, stretched, and others are compressed depending on the score constraints. Um, Yesterday, I, I showed an example that didn't work, so that's a good opportunity for me to show it working. You remember it was this uh, synthes the synthesis of this score that uh, was supposed to be a sung part played together with uh, a piano accompaniment. So in this object we had here, and I tried to put everything together, was actually an OM sheet. So you see now uh, the, the sound with the voice here that was synthesized uh, in the open music, and the piano accompaniment here. Oh, the sound. Okay, so this was just to fix the yesterday's demo, but you can see at the same time that, for instance, uh, here we have a grid that shows the, the time. Every second there is a, a vertical line. And for instance, here where there are lots of sharp signs, the time is a little bit stretched as compared to here or other, other areas in the score. And if you move the one object, it changes you know, that dynamically this spacing is a, is a adapted. Um, if I create a new one, just to show you, oops. so I create an OM sheet box here. So it's empty at the beginning. 
you see here I, I, I created it by connecting a list of objects to the voice input of the this sheet box so let's say I have a voice here I will edit some data in here okay for instance here and uh, okay let's say another one so these are two objects I want to put together I evaluate the box and my objects are here but then you can also manually work inside this editor and add some new objects so an object contain anything it can even contain nothing and and uh, you can play with drag and drop to add object copy object from one box to the other one and then when you will move okay so i can display the, this grid as before and you see all the spacing that takes place while you move the the, the objects on time so in the in the um, an important aspect in the maquette was that you could you can program uh, the different boxes in it and uh, and make uh, set some relations between the the objects so that's also the case uh, in in this uh, sheet editor the first uh, version we had that is described in the in the paper works like this you could just connect put boxes in the editor and uh, and uh, connect the object with relations here we do we create a voice that is the inverse voice the, the second one is the inverse of this one uh, we, we created a, a couple of examples for instance in here uh, we did uh, there was a sound part in the as, as in my previous example but the sound is synthesized from the voice uh, of uh, the score of another voice um, here we make a transformation stre time stretching of a sound according to the constraints of, uh, of the voice uh, the score voice at the top and in the in the second in the new the current version of this uh, sheet editor now we have actually separated the interface into two uh, different panes because uh, this way of representing the relation was was sometimes complicated where you have very big scores and you you ended up with a lot of connections in here so now we have two uh, two parts in the editor I can show you uh, in a real one I select this show sheet patch is here and here I have this special box which represents the contents of here so it's a kind of a meta representation of the object itself inside itself so you see there is a kind of a quick representation of what's in here I have one voice object one cortex object voice 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 four voices they have all a number and I can duplicate this box uh, as many times as I want so this allows you to create these relations uh, I showed in the slide before for instance uh, if let's say I remove this box you see the, the representation is updated here um, and I will select the first one here uh, yes I select this one so in this object ID I do zero now if I evaluate this box this one is in red it means this box now uh, is focused on this object here um, if this one is one I have now two pointers on these two objects and I can uh, program the relations between them for instance uh, I can represent them here I create a voice box so this one is not part of the actual score it's just part of the uh, underlying program I take the object content um, here so if I evaluate this box here now I get the contents of this red box here um, so I will use this 
a function called reverse. I reverse the chords on this box, create a new one. So this one has the reverse chord and the same rhythm. So this maybe needs a little bit of understanding of uh, how open music works, but I hope along with the different example you 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 understand a little bit. So you have when when we have a program here, we always choose to evaluate some parts of the program. So here, for example, if I evaluate this box, I will create a voice. These are the different inputs, and for instance, these inputs represent the rhythm of this uh, of this score, and this one is the pitches, the scores, the the chords. So in this case, the rhythm will just ask what are the rhythm of this one and take the same value, and this uh, one will take the reverse list of chords from the upper voice. So if I evaluate here, okay, it's not a very good example because the chords are all the same, but let's change it a little bit. Oh, oh. Okay, okay. So now, Yep. And if I want this pro this programming to be integrated into the into the score, I just take this voice and connect it to the contents of this one. Okay. And now this box here has be has be related to this one. I can also decide to connect them in their temporal organization. I can access the um, onset of uh, of this object. So now it's zero and say the other one has the same onset plus, say, two seconds. So we speak in milliseconds here, so it's 2,000. And the onset of the second one is two, two seconds after this one. So now, even if I move this object, for instance, OK, here, if I reevaluate my program, the other one will systematically uh, be placed two seconds after the first one. Okay. Jean, yes. well, only one stupid question, but sometimes... No, no, no stupid So uh, the, the parameters on the top mm -hmm. of, of the, the box, they are at they are the same as in the the input and the output. They are yes. the same. Sorry, the same. Yeah. So what going goes in goes out. Yes. Sorry. If you don't do anything. Yes. So that means if you want to have an echo, you uh, you rile up everything. It, there's no change. You copy. Yes. If I connect everything here, you mean that makes the same. Another quicker solution. Um, so maybe. Uh, Yes, this, this, there are two main kinds of box in open music. One are these box that create objects, and these ones are just functions. So the function can be uh, uh, as complex as you want, and the, ob and the objects too. So these, these, the functions here, they just take some input and return some out output. There can be different number of inputs and outputs. For instance, here the plus has two input, one output. The object boxes, there are some we call it factory boxes. It's like if, if uh, an object-oriented language, the instance producer, uh, when you make a new chord, for instance, uh, in Lisp it's called the make instance function. So that's what these boxes do. And uh, in addition, they produce an object and they allow you to visualize the last one they produced or even to open it and change it by hand. So it's a kind of a function box that creates an instance and as a uh, local memory. And the inputs outputs represent the different attributes of this class. So they change for every different every kind of object. For instance, if I do a note object here, so that's a note. The inputs are the pitch, the velocity, the duration, and the MIDI channel. And the outputs are the same. So this, if I connect something to the input Then I evaluate the box, so I, I call it, I say, make your new instance, and it, it changes the pitch here. The other have uh, default values. And if I want to get the value, I just read it from here. I can see, for instance, in the listener, or if I do a, 
textbooks. Oops. I get I want to know the pitch of this object and I take it from here. And the first input and output, it's a special one that represents the instance that has been pr produced. For instance, here I get a kind of a pointer on the node object. So all this to say that if you want to make a simple copy, you don't need to copy all the attributes. You can also just take the output of the instance output and connect to the instance input here. And that implicitly makes a copy. Okay. So even simpler, you just take the output here and you connect here. And you can remove all this part of the program if you don't want to make any change. Okay, all this here is, is never evaluated because it's not connected to this. So now I, I disconnected from the program. Is it, is it clear? Sorry for interrupting. What's the difference between running a program and evaluate the problem? Uh, it's quite the same. Uh, we say evaluate because all these programs are visual representation of Lisp expressions. The Lisp is the programming language that is behind Open Music, and uh, Lisp expression are uh, like you can compile it and create a program and run it, or we can just evaluate it. It's an evaluated language, so we used to say evaluate. But it, ev evaluating a box uh, could correspond to uh, executing the program. Uh, that start at this box and follow all the connections. I'm not. I'm not running the rest. I, I kind of create a virtual expression that corresponds to this, calling this, calling this, calling everything. And I. I want to. There is a reduction. Uh, um, kind of. Uh, inter, uh, how do you say? Traverse uh, creation of a graph, and then I evaluate uh, the different inputs of every box, and the input is connected to another one, so it evaluates the other one, it evaluates the other one, then it returns the result, and I get the result of the boxes I choose to evaluate. Evaluate means I, will, I request the value. Okay. I will uh, speak of, of it after the, the other project I want to speak about concerns this evaluation mechanism and how it's starting to evolve a little bit. Okay? <laughs> and uh, feel free to interrupt if you have some questions because I go a little bit quick on the basics uh, of open music, uh, assuming uh, uh, you're, you're a bit familiar, but uh, you're probably not. So, I have a funny example with this object, which is the, the reconstitution of, okay, no, this is just to show you uh, a, a patch that uh, uh, Carlos Sagan did a few years ago. It, it, he created these strange objects in open music and, and made a, uh, a score which was a reproduction of the microphony score from uh, Karlheinz Stockhausen. So just to show you, you can put very heterogeneous objects in here, even objects that do not uh, really have a mu direct musical uh, meaning. And the example I want to show you is the reconstitution of the Bach uh, tone canon. I don't know how, uh, how to say it in English. So uh, that's part of the musical offering uh, pieces. And uh, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in these pieces, Bach uh, gives some kind of enigmatic uh, instructions. And, uh, and the performer is supposed to decode it and, uh, and, uh, and build the, and play the, play the piece. So in this case, this is the score. It's quite simple. And uh, and um, and uh, as you can read it, the idea is uh, that you you will create a canon with one of these two voices, and uh, the two voices are separated by a perfect fifth. And then the canon, while is uh, going uh, uh, while while is going on, every time it repeats, it's transposed uh, by uh, one tone. So it's the uh, one tone canon. Canon, canon per tonus. So this is quite easy to uh, 
to do in open music. I have just copied the, the different parts here. So this is the first voice. And the second voice, the canonic uh, element is here. This is a recording of the piece by a string ensemble. Maybe we can hear it now. Here is the cycle, and the piano is transposed by one tone, and potentially it never ends. It can be played like it's an infinite piano. So to, to reproduce this mechanism and regenerate the score of, uh, of this canon, we just need uh, one single operation. It's a, vo a transposition. So let me show you quickly. Um, If I have a chord, for instance, this one, and I want to make a transposition in terms of programming, it's just an addition to the pitches. So I use my same plus operator. I take the pitches of this chord, this chord I add say, so we speak in mid descent, so it's every, every half tone is 100. If I want to make a perfect fifth, it's 700. And I connect to the mid descent input, the pitches of the other chord. So at, at this moment, it didn't change. And when I evaluate this box at the bottom, I press a button, a key here, and I transpose my chord. <coughs> So this uh, is quite simple. You can apply it to uh, different uh, every any kind of object. If I want to uh, apply this operation here, the exact same I showed. I just multiplied here by 100 so that I can provide the interval just in semitones in, instead of saying 700. I can say just seven, and I use here. Um, a special Lisp operator called Mapcar. It's uh, something that allows me to make iterations. So the idea is I created my transposition function at the left here. It's, it, that's a function that just adds the pitches of one chord. It's in a special mode here. I don't enter into programming details, but there is a lambda sign here, which means when I evaluate this box, instead of um, Instead of returning a transposed value, it will just return me the function that makes the transposition. So it's called a higher order function in terms of uh, programming. And I will use this function with the map car operator so as to apply this function iteratively to the list of pitches from the input uh, score. So the result here, um, if I disconnect, so I say, let's say seven again. I evaluate the box and it applies this transposition to every successive chords of here. The transposition by seven semitone. Now I remove my seven and I connect this green arrow. The green arrow represents an input of my function. So at the end, this program here, I can close it now and it's, it will represent a function that takes an input 
uh, a score as an input of uh, a voice object. Uh, the second input is a number of semitones, and the output is the transposed voice. So that's how I program a, a function in Open Music. I can now close it, and it's represented by this uh, little red box here. And you can see that if I evaluate here, I indeed have my transposed uh, uh, canonic element. And I also concatenated a little uh, silence at the beginning in order to make the canon. So if I play the two together, let me build a or an OM sheet. Oh, it's uh, sorry. I take this one and uh, this one. Oops. Uh, Okay, so I use two operations here, one shift in time and, and this transposition. So if I want to apply the whole process, I, pre uh, I would like to, I will reinitialize, okay. So I start with my two voices here. And I implement the, all the process here, just of repeating this transposition and uh, a shift like I did before with the plus operator. And I, and I uh, iterate on the different uh, voices. So here, um, sorry, the window is a little bit I will add some empty boxes, up, 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 number of them. And if I evaluate the right part of my program here, I should see, for instance, the canon generating, up, and this one here, here, here. Okay, so I just repeated this transposition. Uh, the, the successive occurrence of one voice on this, uh, of one part on the same voice are just transposed by one tone, so two semitones, and uh, and uh, between the second and the third voice, I, there is an additional transposition of a fifth, seven semitones. And this is the resulting. <laughs> The last one did not start. Uh, okay, so you you have seen the. So this could go over and over, and you can repeat the process. You have any question? Okay, so that was the first uh, interface. I wanted to show. The second one is not exactly a new interface. Um, 
It's actually an extension of the of the standard score editors of Open Music. Uh, we did it uh, in the context of this pro of this project with uh, Carlos Perez Sancho from the University of Alicante. Uh, he wanted to make a harmonic analysis project in the score editors, and uh, we had the idea for a while to allow music uh, analysis to who have some ideas of how to uh, analyze a piece of music to in easily integrate their work by a little bit of programming inside the open music interface. That means not, not only using the tools that exist, but also being able to uh, program their own, uh, their own system. So in this case of, of uh, harmonic analysis, it was inspired by a paper by uh, Brian Pardo and uh, William Birmingham uh, in the Computer Music Journal. Consisted in segmenting the score, and uh, there was a there is an algorithm that allows to uh, take the different uh, segment and estimate what's the tonality of this segment. So that's uh, not very original analysis, but that's the process we choose to uh, test uh, our system. So the the conceptual framework is is relatively simple. Uh, we just consider that a score can be uh, uh, divided into segments. And uh, uh, we try to make uh, the less restriction as possible on what's the definition of a segment. So you can define segments e simply like with a time of beginning, time of an end. Uh, the segment can be contiguous or not. Uh, they can overlap. They can be uh, spread over the score. You can have uh, the same segment can con contain different kinds of data. You can actually define uh, all the the way a segment is defined is up to the, the user or the programmer. In this case, it can be defined by uh, some uh, uh, functional uh, specification. For instance, all the pitches that are higher than this value are considered. Uh, is, that's how I define my segment. And then attached to the different segment, you can uh, put some kind of labels that can be as simple as some text or very complicated data that you relate to the segment. So the, the, the job of someone uh, implementing a, an analysis system in this framework is just to define what, what he uh, considers uh, a segment and how he computes this data that is attached to the different segments. And then the framework uh, we developed allows to uh, take care of all the uh, user interface and integration in the editor. So there is a... Uh, uh, simple hierarchy of new object that is added. So the score object here is the, the existing open music part. And that's what we added. We, there is a, a super class called abstract analysis. Uh, all the an different analysis you want to add must be subclasses of this one. And the analysis contains a number of segments. So we have some predefined segment, as I said, the time segments, the chord segments, you just say, you select some chords and you define a segment with it. Or you can also define your own uh, class of segment. So that makes a quick, a short, uh, small API like this, an application programming interface, uh, which define the different functions to know. For instance, uh, these are the class of uh, segments you can use or, or, or redefine, and uh, some function like compute analysis segments, it returns the list of segments, analyze, analyze one segment, it creates a seg uh, the data for one segment, etc. There is a number of functions, you are not you don't need to implement all of them, but the one you need. I will show you an example and uh, create this uh, pitch class set analysis uh, and add it uh, in the Open Music uh, editor. So <clears throat> I just need a chord sequence. Okay. This one is okay. So this is a sequence of chord. Not play like Moreno, but I have lots of MIDI files. So, oops, sorry. Okay, so it's already loaded. So I will maybe restart my system and start with nothing. So I will start with fresh. Music. Yep. 
my chord, my chord sequence. So here uh, I am in a special mode that's been added to the uh, Open Music Editors called Segmentation and Analysis. When you're in this mode, you can right click and add a new analysis to um, to the to the editor. So here there is these two analyses available, and I want to create a new one. These are just test test analyses that they do not. Uh, they are not very useful. For instance, this one allows me to just put some markers and say and add some information at, at several places. For instance, uh, section two. Yeah. That's a kind of segmentation already, very simple. So if I want to add a new one, I will. So this is, as I said, it's more for. Uh, an uh, analysis that can program a little bit. So my code is, is uh, relatively short, it's just this. Um, here I define a class, that's uh, the Lisp syntax for defining classes, it's called PC set analysis, and that's a subclass of the abstract analysis class that I showed before. So I evaluate this expression here, and now if I want to add a new analysis, I have my PC set analysis available here. So I say, okay, select this one. For the moment, I cannot do anything. I can just set a name for this analysis. And you see there are some uh, actions like run segmentation, analyze segments, analyze selected segments, etc. but they are all disabled because I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, program anything yet. The first operation is to define the segment, as I said. So I will use the, an existing type of segments that I've mentioned before called the chord segment. And for this, I say, what's the default segment class for my analysis? So that's also a Lisp syntax. And I say that's the chord segment. Yeah. So I evaluate this expression. And now I have the possibility to select some chord and define some segments. So the color uh, doesn't mean anything. It's just, uh, it's just, uh, randomly selected. So that's something, it's not very much an analysis yet, but um, I can now, um, if I want to enable these uh, functions here, it's, it's quite simple. For instance, I say compute segments P, it's a predicate that determines if my uh, analysis is able to compute the segments itself. So I say yes, T means true, it's, a, it's yes. So now I have this run segmentation uh, available, but I still did not program it. So if I run the segmentation, it does nothing. My segmentation here is called compute analysis segments. So all these names are not randomly chosen. That's part of this uh, API. It's just, you know, it's not, I think there is like 15 functions that you can decide to program on a if you don't, it's okay, but you just need to read the, the comments here and know what, what is what uh, is needed for you. So my function compute analysis segment does the following. Um, I take all the chords and I make a chord segment instance for every chord. So that's my default segmentation. Every chord is a segment. Okay, so that's make instance chord segment and the ident identifier of this segment is just the number of this call. So it's, yep. I evaluate this expression. And now if I say run segmentation, it says, okay, that's also programmed in my function. This operation will delete the current segmentation. Continue, yes, click. Now every code is, is, has become a segment. Questions? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I, want, I want to make a kind of connection. Okay. Uh -huh. I, I, I think 70% uh, of the class here is not familiar with Lisp. Yeah, that's why I'm not yeah, yeah, but, too but, much. Uh, yes, but, but so only uh, what he showed there is the, a predefined uh, uh, set of Lisp programs. So he's using that as a kind of prototype. Uh, but my, my another question is uh, when you present the score, 
as it is now. Mm -hmm. The representation of the time in this score is proportional. Yes, yes. This the is... other one was not proportional. When you use proportional or, uh, notation for the score, mm -hmm. when you use uh, real notation, it's, how, it's, it, how it's, it is described? Yes, it's, uh, it's just because these are two different kinds of objects. You have in open music, the main score object are the chord sequence. Is this one? It's it's a uh, with proportional time representation, and the other one is a voice. And the voice is the one I used in the previous example, and this is more uh, rhythmic notation. So you or the composer use the one they need when they need it, and uh, and and. Uh, in this case, I use it because but you, it's a bit we different. can mix up. We can mix proportional with a uh, voice. It doesn't matter. You can mix if you, you can use, sync then as well. For instance, in the sheet editor I showed before, it's done for this purpose of having, for instance, two different objects that are not in the same time referential, and we try to represent them together. Um, in the program, you can mix what you want. You can even, for instance, if I take my sequence here. And I connect, there are some automatic transcription. transcription. It's not very accurate, you see. That's why I use this one, because it's a MIDI file. And here, the, I, I play it as it is. If I try to make it in a, fit in a rhythmic uh, pattern, if I don't know. Right. Oh, it's good. But sometimes it can be bad because it just approximated to the closest. Uh, uh, so that's the problem of uh, quantification. Uh, it's a, a very old problem. Uh, actually, one of the one of the predefined analysis you have here. If I say canseg, it's used for this problem of quantification. I can I select I create some segments and. Uh, Within every segment, it will give me what's uh, an, a representation of the rhythmic pattern that corresponds to this segment, regardless of the pitches. That's what I had uh, in the patch when I opened it. That's why uh, also I had these boxes here. So this box takes the result of this quanti the quantification analysis and Create a so in this case it's bad because one thing uh, that uh, was realized uh, quick is that when you want to quantify a MIDI file or a chord sequence into a voice, uh, it's much better if you do it by segment and because there can be some changes of tempo or something. So uh, the, the, the objective of here is say, okay, I will quantify separately this one, this one, this one. But I didn't set the parameters, so I just kept the parameters by default with tempo 60, uh, 4, 4, etc., etc. So that's, uh, that's why it doesn't give a good result in this case, but you can work out the different segment uh, separately. So let me just finish with this one. So I have the I have my segments here, and now I define um, how to analyze one segment. So for this, I will take a little bit of advance on your presentation of tomorrow with Moreno. We have an object called N circle. It's a circle that's supposed to represent uh, the the pitch class uh, representation of uh, of a chord. So if you if you have a given chord and you use the function uh, chord to C, shop here, you set a. a Approximate and two, it's okay. So, and you get the, the pitch class uh, representation of this call. So that's what I want to use in my analysis here. So I do analyze one segment, 
I applied the same function. So everything that's in Open Music can be used in the Lisp programming part two. Say chord to C. Uh, I take a chord with all the pitches that are in my segment, and that's the, the segment data of this segment. So I evaluate this. I enable the analyze segment function. And now I can say analyze segments. So now every, every segment has this kind of label with uh, instance of the NSERC. I need to draw them correctly. So that's my last two functions. One is segment data to string. So it writes the contents as a string instead of just the pointer to the instance. So in this case, I just read what are the the values in my circle. So here it's 0, 2, 5, 5, 8, 0, 2, 8, etc. And in this one, I draw the circle. So that's the drawing functions, the draw circle. And I draw the string of the number here. So now I get my analysis here. So the same process has been applied, but it's slightly more complicated with this harmonic analysis project. So it's the, the he, has, he had an algorithm that makes a segmentation of the score uh, according to some uh, relation of the pitches that continue or that are more frequent in the segment. And then he has a, a, pre, a prediction of what's the, the tonalities. This work is contained in a library that you can load on, on top of Open Music. It's called Harmonic Analysis. I won't detail the code because it's more complicated than this one. But I can say Add New Analysis. Now I have a number of new analyses available. This Harmonic Analysis. And this one does not let me choose the segment myself, but it does only the whole operation of segmentation and analysis because it decided like this. So that's the result. You can, the, the idea of this analysis uh, uh, method is that you will validate the different segments and say if you agree or not. If I double click one segment, I agree and it goes to the next one and the next one and so on. You can say that you don't agree with the segmentation itself and modify it and when you're okay or you can also change the tonality because you are not agree with the result and you go forward. The idea being that the, the, the corrections and the modifications you make will be taken into account in the future uh, to better estimate the rest of the of the um, of the tonal the harmonic analysis. Have questions? Uh, sorry, one more question. Yes. Uh, I guess I guess you are taking the experience of the uh, the guy that works with the interface as a cue for the program understand the harmony. Mm -hmm. That means the experience. The guy say this is C major, and the computer takes this C major definition. My question is. Do you keep in doing that so the system learns with the user uh, the harmonic analysis in such a way that, see, if my view of harmony is different than yours, when I, I'm uh, analyzing it, it will you learn with me? Yes, uh, well, um, yes, and that's uh, actually the, not the concern of the framework. Uh, I'm showing here because the idea is here we provide everything for someone to to integrate his own system of analysis and in this case the the the, the system here as as I have it maybe uh, uh, in the University of Alicante they have worked on it uh, since then but uh, the one I have it just take your correction into account and will maybe modify the 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 probability for choosing again this uh, wrong choice in the next time. But so it learns, 
it learns every time you rerun the analysis, it's a, it's a, it starts with a fresh memory. But you could imagine to make the same system with more uh, intelligent uh, uh, system of analysis. Yeah. Yes. Good. Good <laughs> segmentation, uh, it can recognize uh, similar structures uh, with the same contour or, or the same nodes? Um, once again, uh, here the system uh, does not recognize anything. As a, you put the symbols. Yes, as I showed in, in, my, in my version, the first one with the... Oops. Uh, this one, uh, the automatic segmentation, it just, it was very silly. It takes one chord, one segment. And if I want to make a better segmentation, like in this case, or more advanced segmentation, uh, that's an algorithm that can be programmed by anyone in, in a, uh, who wants to integrate his system. So in this case, I don't exactly know how it works, but uh, it, it, it follows the paper I mentioned before from the harmonic uh, analysis process. I, and, and I don't remember exactly. Uh, if you want a motivic analysis, uh -huh. motif, variations of motif, yes. it do doesn't uh, recognize. It could, it could be, but uh, for instance, there, there exists, there have been some work in open music with motivic analysis, and that would be, for instance, interesting to transfer this work in this framework in order to make an analysis, a segmentation uh, corresponding to, to the result of a motivic analysis. But in this case, it, it's, not the, it's not implemented uh, in the system right now. This uh, open music as a system in general has as few as possible things implemented. And we expect the user, generally composers, but also sometimes uh, musicologists to uh, integrate their own algorithm of segmentation or, or composition or whatever in the environment. This is kind of a uh, silly environment. It does not know anything about music. <laughs> you have a question? No? Go for the key. Okay, so this, this, that was uh, kind of an introduction to, uh, to the, the core of the, uh, the things I wanted to show today, uh, emphasizing the, the interactive aspects that go uh, around the main programming activity of the environment, which is usually more focused on these uh, patches like this. So I will switch again to the slide for a few minutes. So this was our composer, he's still here. And uh, he has a lot of uh, different environment. He wants to make some programming, but he wants also to use some scores. And very, of very often he uses uh, interactive uh, uh, frameworks uh, in Max MSP or Pure Data or this kind of environment. So the the uh, recent works uh, that we are carrying out in Open Music uh, are trying to understand and address this uh, strong paradigmatic shift that exists currently in the computer music tools between uh, Open Music like environment also uh, from that are derived from patchwork or PWGL, and the world of uh, uh, interactive real-time systems. So the first uh, confusion that some, sometimes people make is saying, OK, this open music is for making scores, and Max MSP is for making sounds. But uh, we have seen uh, in, in lots of different uh, works that, uh, for instance, what I've shown yesterday, that you can do lots of sound processing in open music, also in PWGL, and there are lots of works in Max MSP uh, that are done uh, at IRCAM and other places, and also the, all the improvisation frameworks and this uh, new Bach library that deals with scores in open music that find uh, at the end uh, all the symbolic aspect of music composition can also be handled in uh, real-time systems. 
So um, this this other uh, distinction, the, the composition versus performance, is maybe more uh, more uh, accurate to 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 separate these uh, these uh, two uh, different families of uh, of tools. Uh, indeed, you can uh, you can easily work with all your compositional material, generate scores, generate sounds uh, in open music, and you can run the things you have done or take care, take into account some interactions or or, or define the uh, interaction with the audience, with the performers, uh, or with yourself during the concert in an environment like Max MSP. Uh, usually we call deferred time the environments like open music as opposed to the real time paradigm of uh, max or pure data and that's uh, indeed uh, uh, an interesting uh, point of view to focus on the notion of time in these two kinds of environments um, as you know music is mostly about building time structures so the way your system deals with time uh, influence a great deal how you make music and what kind of music you make so in the if you if you try to compare the time of your program with the real time of the music well when we are in uh, open music for instance we have these two times completely separated you have, you make a program you create a visual program and then you evaluate or you run your program so there is uh, the program runs and it creates some data and this data has its own time own timeline in, internal to the score to the sound and uh, it's played uh, uh, during the concert independently of the time of the process that created it. That allows this process to take the time of music into account and to build very complex, uh, complex musical structures. You can, you can uh, create with a, simple, a single program, you can create a whole symphony that has very complex time relation between the, the different parts, the end and the beginning, and that's independent of the... <coughs> That makes uh, that makes this time uh, of your program independent from the the time of the music, but that somehow uh, cuts this program from all any kind of interaction with his environment. In the real time approach in Max, for instance, the two times the time of the music that's going on is runs at the same time as the as the program. So you can make lots of reactivity. Uh, every every bit, every cycle in your program uh, generates a little bit of music, and the program uh, advent, uh, goes forward at the same time as the musical time. So these two, uh, these are the two conception of time uh, uh, we are interested in putting together in a more intricate way, uh, instead of having these two uh, conception completely different, as it's the case now. Um, so, I explained this before, the, the, the mechanism of evaluation in open music. Um, we call it demand-driven because, as I said, you are, when you have a program like this one, you select a box and you say, I want to evaluate it. So you start from here in the program and, and there is a mechanism that, that follows the connection and computes the values and returns the data. So that's how uh, the, the execution of an open music program works. So as I said, it's independent from the time of this structure here is computed in here, but uh, it's, uh, it's an independent uh, structure of the program. There exists a lot of interaction that uh, I've shown you before, the possibility to interact with the data and the score editors and the different uh, uh, works around we are carrying out on the interfaces. But this interaction uh, takes place when you build. If you think of uh, the activity of uh, using Open Music as being dealing with program, so you interact during the building of this program, but not during this, its execution. And the idea here would be to allow this the an, a running open music program to be integrated in this loop I showed before, like not running any program 
Open Music program in real time, but integrate the, an execution of such program in the real time of a music performance or just a, a, a music uh, being played on the computer. So we have uh, published an article recently with uh, Jean-Louis Javito, uh, which uh, tried to address this problem uh, from a very formal point of view and uh, defined a semantics of what is the evaluation of uh, an open music program and how we can extend this, uh, extend this, uh, the, the evaluation mechanism to make it reactive. And for this, uh, we realized that it was necessary to include uh, in these semantics not only what's going on when the program is evaluated, but also what's going on when it's constructed by the programmer. Uh, and then the reactive extension. So we defined, we defined, uh, we had the formal definition of what's an open music program. So it looks like a graph like this one, and there are lots of uh, description of it. And then we add the notion of time in this graph. So we take, we, we consider a, it's a program at time t. And then the time is a logical time that uh, increments itself when some kind of events happen. So the events that can make the time in being incremented in, by default uh, in, the, in the standard mechanism is just when you evaluate a box, as I said. And in this case, the, the graph, the values in the program are updated and there are new values and, uh, and you, you, you made a, somehow a kind of step forward. So that's what we call a request. And then we add the notion of events in the environment. It's anything else that can also uh, uh, generate this step forward in the in the in the time representation of the program. So I will show uh, some concrete examples. So we have this notion of event. Uh, two things have been implemented: the the different things that generate events and an update mechanism that uh, make the program uh, execute when an event occurs. So the, the update mechanism is kind of the inverse as the evaluation I shown before. Imagine this is an open music program and there is an event uh, uh, happening at the box uh, G here. So the events can be, I will show some example, uh, something that changes this box. For instance, in the previous examples I've shown, uh, I open a chord box and I add a note inside. So that's an event. I've changed something in the program. And if I decide this is an event, I trigger this update mechanism. So it makes kind of the inverse um, the inverse uh, path in the graph and goes down, downstream the graph and find terminal boxes at the bottom. Uh, there is a mechanism that avoid to uh, make uh, unnecessary uh, pass. And then when it reaches uh, the box at the bottom, it just evaluates this box as if it was a standard request from the user. So I will show you some examples, and uh, the, interesting asp the interesting thing is that all this mechanism is uh, strictly transparent from the user, and you can, I can take the program I made before and just uh, trigger, uh, switch the state of the boxes to be reactive boxes, and you will, be, you will see some completely different uh, behaviors. This is after. So, for instance, let me. Okay, uh, this is a patch in Open Music, uh, quite standard patch. It takes a random node between two, between two values, and uh, adds some pitches to create a chord. Okay, each time I evaluate this box here, I have a new, a new code. Repeats this process 30 times, uh, generates a list of 30 codes, and I, I have them here. And uh, so this is the pitch, and, and the onsets are also computed by this random function here. Okay. So I have a program like this and I will I, I have a, a key that I don't know if you see it, so it becomes 
a range that makes some part of this patch reactive. Which means now if I modify the value here, it automatically updates all the rest of the patch uh, that is reactive. So I put it red in order to make it uh, visible here. In this case, it stops here, but if I also select the boxes here, that makes the whole, <coughs> the whole patch reacting and being updated uh, every time uh, something changes somewhere. So the patch can be uh, pretty much complex. Um, if I take another one, like this one. So this one creates a, a melody that follows a given profile and, uh, and there is a, a control of the density of the different calls. So let's do it. I put everything reactive and now if I modify any value in this patch, okay, I, I have all the, all the rest updated. You can use some uh, interfaces like the slider boxes. If I create a slider here, um, and that will be used to generate one of the nodes, for instance. So I, I select two bounds for these nodes. I set the slider reactive. Um, I connect the value to one of the nodes. And whoop. now I can use this kind of control to, uh, to update my value. So I wanted to make a complex one. It's not yet. Uh, complex enough because uh, in order to stress that even if it's reactive it's still not real-time programs I cannot guarantee that when I move here this is immediately or after a number of time uh, being updated so the objective is not to make real-time processes like you do uh, in max but uh, to be able to interact when you are creating a program. In, in this example here that I had on the slide, it's, it's a piece by uh, Philippe Leroux that's been uh, premiered in the Manifest Festival uh, last June. And uh, he used the, the, the system, the system uh, in, in communication with uh, a special pen interface that sends data to the computer when it draws something on the paper. And you see that the the this is Open Music behind, and the Open Music received the data uh, and uh, updated the, the different aspects of the of the compositional program depending on the drawing of the composer. You can um, it's interesting, for instance, if you things that were used uh, in in this in this work were well, some uh, some uh, receive box that I will show an example uh, after that uh, receive OSC messages or MIDI messages, and uh, this is the uh, also the, another kind of event I showed before. It's a box that when it receives a message, it triggers an event and updates the the, the patch. You can also use some internal sender or receivers if you decide to send, uh, you say send curve here, and this one is somewhere else. This one says receive curve, and it's connected Or DPF. So now, and every time I 
do something in this in this curve here you see this object is also updated at the bottom rup, rup. so that's the kind of uh, communica internal communication that was used uh, in this uh, in this project with philippe leroux to spread the data one stroke of one pen stroke was spread all over and uh, and uh, influenced lots of uh, different uh, uh, parts of the program So, reactive batches. So, here is an example with uh, receiving MIDI notes. So, that's why I wanted to use the keyboard, but it's okay because uh, no, no, it's no problem. Because I have a simulated keyboard here. Keyboard. So, this just sends MIDI, MIDI notes. Uh, if I if I create a note object here, and activate this MIDI in box. Doesn't send. Huh? Oh, it worked before. Uh, uh huh. In Max? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The communication. Uh, doesn't send anything, yeah? Sorry? Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, that's that's it. You're right. Okay, so here my, thank you, <laughs> my note object here received anything I play on the keyboard. Um, you will see, uh, when we do this kind of uh, process, we soon need to uh, use functions to group the incoming data. Because if I want to collect not the note but the chord, a chord that is played, even if I play almost oops, at the same time, uh, I will always receive the note one by one. 
So I use the group in, and it, it has a, a delta time. So in this case, it's 100 milliseconds. And in 100 millisecond time frame, it considers the node being part of the same chord. Okay, so now um, in. Okay, if I play quick, he said he, he keeps them as a as a chord. If I um, activate this part of the program, you see that's a little. It's a little program that makes a, a kind of a melody after each note I play. Okay, every time I play a key, it takes some pitches in this chord and makes a little melody with this one. Um, it's maybe it could play at the same time. So you see here an, an example of um, how the, the 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 graph I shown before with oops, the open music being integrated, for instance, in a, an interactive uh, situation where the MIDI in notes come in and they are processed and they are uh, sent back to the real time of of performance uh, dynamically. The boxes you see here are uh, collector boxes. If, for instance, you want to make some more advanced process than just building these uh, little notes here, and you want to collect everything that is played in a memory and process this memory, and sometime later maybe uh, send this uh, information or the, the transformed information back into the into the the performance. So for here, for instance, I. I collect each time so you see my my memory here is growing and I can decide to reinitialize it sometimes oops so. um, if I want to make this process a, a Give more control from the from the the performance to this whole process. I can use some more advanced uh, tools like uh, I think it's this one. Yes, we have a root box that is similar to the root box you have uh, in Max if you are familiar with Max, and allows you to send the OSC messages and separate the, the comments depending on the message. So for instance, here I can, I can send to the environment the message play, stop, initialize, etc. And uh, if uh, I use a patch like this one, where I can send different kind of information. Uh, oop. I will activate this receive box. And if, if my program works, we see receive file. Okay, so he receives the message. Ah, oh. this one should be turned off. Maybe the other one. Yep. Meet, uh, what? So, uh, 
not, not, not. Okay, well, I don't know, something's not working, but you should you should receive the same notes here and uh, being able to do send a message like initialize, etc. I see here I received the message, but somehow they are not processed correctly. So I'll go back to my previous example. In this one, for instance, um, you have the segment here and you want to reverse. So you collect something, you reverse the pitches as I did before. Okay. And that's this one that you will play at the end. Let's see you start. Okay, so well, it's not. This is not maybe not very interesting, but you see the idea of uh, having this loop between what's going, what's being played, what's being processed uh, in open music, and what's returned back to uh, to play back with the the MIDI output and MIDI input. So same can it didn't work, but same can be done with the uh, OSC and the other kind of communication. Yes. Just in this case, uh, okay. Uh, in this case, who is actually playing the music or Max? Because if you have, like, mm -hmm. if you want to reverse something, it's not real time. You need the entire yes, sequence. Yes, that's, 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 that's what it's. Uh, it's an interesting uh, uh, trade-off or. Uh, uh, a position to take because here we are not in a real time environment. We don't want to, to do real time computation. We, we don't expect one note being sent from Max, processed, and sent back because you can do this in Max directly. But this can be seen kind of like a, a parenthesis in the real time. And you send some data and you trigger some processing, and sometimes you request some results or results are sent back to you. Um, or maybe I can rephrase us, which is the best way to, to send data, not real time data uh -huh. to Max. Let's say, well, I got this sequence, so now I went Max to play it, but maybe I want to filter something. Max. Yes, that. Okay, if I want to play this, so I can either play it in Open Music, that's what I do here. I just have my own box here. What we are working on now is uh, on a um, kind of more sophisticated scheduling system that would allow me to trigger some actions corresponding to some data structures I have. And uh, without uh, predefining what's the action to take on this structure, for instance. Here it's simple because it's not so I can just send it to the MIDI player. But if it's some more complex or more specific data structure, I just have some time information and I don't exactly know what and typically I want to re return it back to Max. Uh, then I can make a kind of virtual player that just schedules the event and does the action at the right moment. But right now I cannot just read the, the content of a chord sequence mm -hmm. in Max. Um, Yes, as a list or something. Yes, uh, you can. See it's a easy to it's, it's, it's easy to send it all as a block in Max. This we can do. Uh, if I do a, a OSC send message, I do OSC send here. Uh, blah, blah, blah. This and the results of my 
processing here. That goes here and the port. I try. <clears throat> and in max, I do a UDP receive. This one. Oops. It's not of type integer um, list. I'm just trying to format a OSC message. Up. Receive. Did I make a mistake? Uh, no. Well, that's how I would okay, do but, it. But I don't I, know why it doesn't work, but I can just send the data here. I would receive it in mass. Um, window console. Ah, by report. Okay. Okay. So now. Okay, so the, the, the last example with this reactive process is back to our topic of uh, analysis. You remember the end circle object? I will, I will connect it to the, these reactive processes. And this will make, okay, I can dynamically see what is going on on my keyboard being played as a, as a chord, or we have an object that's still in development. It's a representation of the tonnets. So for the moment, it's uh, not very intelligent yet. It, it, it doesn't know which, no to shoes in the grid, so he selects everything, but you can imagine he should select the right one. Okay, so, and with my group here, I just, it's too, it's too uh, low, so I always have one values. If I select a, a bigger time frame, I can make some calls. And actually, I don't have the keyboard, but I can just simulate this and play a up um, where is my synthesizer? So what's going on here? It's this object. I can actually even. Uh, 
add this analysis and segmentation. This editor is playing, is sending MIDI events to the system, and, and my patch here received the MIDI event from the system. So I have this a network of connections between the MIDI player and the, and the score that's being played, and my different representations. What's, what's the original tune? Just test. Okay. Some more questions? Huh? Can you take the mic? Right. It's because here I have the here I get, I extracted just the chords, but that, that's the full uh, yeah. it's not, it's not audio. <laughs> no, no. So there is a question from Jose Padovani. Uh, he asks if the reactive feature is already integrated in the co current version of OM. There is another question. Um, Let me answer maybe this one. Yes. Uh, it's it's a. Uh, it's integrated in the last in the available version of the source. It's a six point nine, but the re the currently released one on the Aircam forum is six point eight. So it's not in it's uh, it's it's not available in the distributed uh, compiled version. Except if you there is a link somewhere. Uh, if if you check on the web pages, I have no network here, but there is a you can load it as a separate library on top of OM six point seven six point eight. And uh, it works more or less the same. Okay. There is actually two questions, more two questions. Uh, he says, even if there are Linux versions of uh, OM source code available, is, it is still quite difficult to compile in other distros which are not based in Fedora, Linux Fedora, like uh, not R RPM based distros, like Ubuntu, Debian. Mm -hmm. He asks if uh, there is a plane or possibility to distribute bit binaries for these um, other distros. We, ha we have a Linux developer is in Norway, and uh, it's, we should he should ask uh, directly on in the open music list because uh, uh, I don't even have a Linux computer myself. <laughs> okay, and the last question is about the. The libraries, OM libraries that are exclusive, exclusively for for all subscribers. If there is a plan to to make them free, and uh, if you if you have access to this to those libraries, you have access to the source code to uh -huh. to personalization, etc. Yes, uh, no, uh, I don't know about any plan to make it free, but uh, all the tools I've shown today is uh, is not part of this. Libraries. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's if uh, 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 only about communication, you. As Fernando asked you, that means you have a kind of, uh, you said it's an interruption. You have an interruption and you compile and send back. 
Have you tried any application with network music? So that means we have a guy there that's do some processing anal analysis. You play and you send the analysis to to the guy. Opa, oh, you do it so no. like a, like you have a <laughs> talk in between a composer, uh -huh. improviser, and an analyst. You mean with this kind of system? Yeah, yeah. Because I, I guess uh, the uh, open music is like a, a, an, an anal analytical mind. And the other one is more a kind of real-time in, in, in positive, more reactive. And uh, you combine them together, but uh, it's still one more properly for analysis. In my opinion, maybe I'm wrong, the other one is more for reaction, for interaction. So that means in my mind comes why. One is more like analytical thinking that can be uh, connect to the real time flow. Mm -hmm. So it's like you have a brain connecting in a network. Uh -huh. So, yes. But the, the question of network is independent because here we communicate with, uh, for instance, uh, UDP messages. So I'm in my own computer, but that means well, it, would, it would work the same if uh, this part would be on another computer and open music on my computer. The, in principle, <laughs> I never tried. In our concept, yeah. In, in our concept, we try it. Uh -huh. We see some. Yeah. Maybe we can try. Yeah. A good place to try. No, yes. No, we don't need the rehearsal. In the rehearsal, yeah. No, this is all uh, quite. Uh, that's the first time I show these uh, reactive things uh, uh, in in public. So it's never been tried in the real life, <laughs> for the moment. Um, yeah. If we have, if if we have some more time, or I can show, I can show some. More, I don't know. We have more time. Or we can stop. Okay, go ahead. Because uh, yesterday I I had no time to show some um, parts of uh, uh, sound specialization that are also being uh, possible to control in open music. So I. Can take ten minutes and show a couple of examples. So I will close all this. So for all those who were not here yesterday, I spent a lot of time showing how you can control sound synthesis processes in Open Music. And uh, I will just complete this presentation with. Let's not say. Uh, yep. <coughs> um, okay, no. Okay, so. The, the 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 open music tools for sound specialization they look uh, I'm sorry I switched completely the topic so you can forget about all the the previous um, and switch back to your state of mind after yesterday's presentation <laughs> so we have kind of similar uh, uh, control structures as we use for sound synthesis it's kind of two dimensional matrix container that define the, the specialization parameters for a number of sources and, uh, and different uh, parameters that are related to space. So that's in these boxes here. Uh, here it doesn't look like a matrix because actually there is just one source and uh, this is uh, the trajectory and uh, this is the speed of the source. And then we have different renderer, and uh, this is the multi-channel outside. So the, the the main idea is we focus on this structure here that defines the sources and their uh, and their parameter in the in the space position principally, but also reverberation or orientation, etc. Uh, and we don't at, at this stage we don't care about uh, how it's going to be rendered, what technology of specialization, how many speakers or room configuration, etc. Aside from here, I have 
uh, this simple data structure that represents my speakers. So for instance, if I have uh, seven speakers like this in the room, um, I say that these are the positions of my speaker and I evaluate the sound box at the bottom and it computes me a seven channel sound file. The, um, the renderer are of two kinds. Okay, that's the seven channel sound file corresponding to my source here. Doing this trajectory in a room and with seven speakers at this position. In this case, uh, the rendering and this specialization class is part of the OM Prisma library. It's a, a library uh, based on C sound and uh, makes, uh, allows you to choose uh, uh, between numerous different renderers for uh, specializing the sound. And we have another renderer that uses the SPAT engine from IRCAM and does, is able to do pretty much the same kind of operation. But then for, for other applications uh, in, the, in the other examples, you will see that the different uh, rendering techniques from OM SPAT or OM Prisma uh, are more or less suited to different uh, applications. The, um, so it's not very useful to listen to the examples because we don't have a specialization uh, setup here. Uh, the stereo is working, right? So for instance, if we do this one, in stereo, so stereo is just two speakers, uh, and I follow these circular trajectories. Oh no, it's not good. And I will add the speed curve here. Maybe we can hear something. Yes, yes. So here, as I do circular motion with two speakers, it should just do like this, this, and this. we go uh, quicker and quicker because this is the curve of the speed. So in the in these other examples, uh, you see the same kind of process, but with several sources. So in this case, the matrix is three columns corresponding to three different sound files, and we have different trajectories. We have one circle, two, and the other one is uh, steady at, at a, a single point. Uh, you can use all the tools, algorithmic tools from Open Music to generate uh, trajectories. Okay, for instance, it's quite easy to, to program some interesting things, even if you, it's hard to hear after, but uh, it's, it's uh, <laughs> um, and uh, okay, for, in for instance, here, uh, you can uh, well, in the OM SPAT version, not the not the CSON one, the one used the SPAT. We communicate with SPAT using SD files. That's another the third time we we see these files uh, since yesterday. It's a it's a format that allows to store time data. In this case, just X Y Z positions. So this file here contains all the information for my from my trajectories. They can be communicated with the the the, the renderer to, to make the sound file. But you can also transmit them, for instance, and we see here again this uh, the time paradigm issue between Open Music and Max. I made this little interface here to, for the communication. Hopefully now with the reactive feature, we can do some more interesting uh, things. So this stores all the data in Max. And then it plays, uh, it sends this as a OSC messages 
typically you can receive it with the SPAT or other tools in Max and apply these trajectories to real time input, uh, sound input. So this is just, I also have a kind of a visualizer for the, for to see what is going on. Yep. Oops. Um, Um, uh, yes, yeah, so here in this case we have all the same trajectory but with different uh, speeds. So the, the, these different sources they move but uh, they, they follow the same, same trajectory. So here we make no sound but it's just to vis visualize what we are sending to Max. If we send it, in this case, uh, we send these messages here, but uh, no one receives. So that's more the SPAT uh, aspect, which is useful to communicate trajectories with SPAT and uh, synthesize some uh, sources. With OM Prisma, uh, we work with uh, C sound and we can make more advanced processes, uh, including uh, sound uh, transformation. Uh, in this example, I take one single source. This um, <laughs> Okay, and uh, I have a process that estimates the pitch here. For this, I use the Super VP estimate, uh, fundamental frequency estimation. So that's a, a pitch uh, fundamental frequency estimation of my sound. And I use this data to generate the trajectory. Okay, so that's the trajectory. And typically, the more uh, high, the higher the pitch, uh, the more on the right, and the lower the pitch, the more on the left. And then I can use this trajectory to specialize uh, this sound file, and I will make a stereo rendering. Um, stereo. Stereo book. If it Can't hear it. I don't know if it works. <laughs> I'm so close to that. Okay. Um, other uh, one important and uh, and a very uh, powerful uh, aspect in this uh, OM Prisma library is to be able to combine with sound synthesis processes in C sound. So this is a, a process, a sound synthesis process from OM Chroma library. It does just synthesis, mono synthesis. Um, for instance, this is using the fourth algorithm the same as yesterday. Make some kind of bells. And OM Prisma follows the exact same architecture as OM Chroma as far as the data structures are concerned. So you can use one object for synthesis, one object for specialization. This is the position of the different 
every different uh, pitch in the synthesis will be specialized. It's computed randomly. And once again, I can generate any kind of uh, multi-channel sound file. So I will do it stereo. Okay, and, th and this kind of process is uh, interesting mostly when you relate the two processes. Here I have the same kind of example with this uh, sound, where uh, in the first, I have different configuration of uh, the specialization, and if different grain in this synthesis is uh, specialized at a different position. Uh, for instance, here it should be uh, describe this kind of circle, so you will hear uh, from left to right, uh, from middle to right, but uh, if we are with more speakers, it makes a circle around you. It's not stereo. Whoop. Stereo rendering. <clears throat> okay, and in this case, uh, the position of the um, of the different grains depend on their main pitch, uh, like in the violin example. So with this you can develop very groups, very complex processes um, and connect also the sound specialization to the sound synthesis and to the rest of your uh, sound synthesis, the, of your compositional process. The last example here is back to the first one with Ba. Use the same the same synthesis and specialization process as this one we just heard, but uh, in connection with uh, a score. Okay, so there is here a process that takes the different chords in this piece and. Map everything to sound sound synthesis and sound specialization parameter according to uh, different analysis of the contents uh, harmonic contents of the of the score, and that generates this kind of configuration where the di the different notes are split over the uh, around the audience, and uh, it's it's not very worth computing it again, but in this case. In the second case, it's uh, another version where this kind of configuration does circle around. For instance, a given pitch will be here, and then next time it occurs, it moves along the along the piece. So that's an idea of how it sounds in stereo. Thank you very much. Thank you.